Well, welcome back. I trust that you had a good lunch today. You all look awake and alert. You know, we only have one hour in the afternoon, so uh, I think we all should be able to keep awake. At least I know I will, and I hope that all of you will as well. Uh, we are going to continue our study of Revelation chapter 17. And what I'm going to do is review the last five minutes or so of our last session, and then we are going to go into some new material. Uh, we're going to begin at the subtitle that says the perspective of Daniel 11 verses 40 to 45 in your syllabus. Now, let's review what we studied from Revelation chapter 12. There we are told that the dragon persecuted the woman for 1,260 years, right? But towards the end of this period, what happened with the waters that the dragon was spewing out of his mouth? The waters that he was spewing out of his mouth were dried up by the earth. Is that the end of the story? No. Do the waters flow again? Yes, because it says the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. So we have these three stages in Revelation chapter 12. The 1260 years when the waters are flowing, then the earth swallows up the waters, the waters don't flow anymore, and then the dragon is enraged and the waters are flowing again to try and drown the remnant of her seed. Now in Revelation 13 we have a similar scenario. Do we have a beast that ruled for 42 months? Absolutely. What happened at the end of that month, uh, of the 42 months? It received a deadly wound. All of the heads? No, one of the heads was only functioning during the 42 months. A head received a deadly wound. How many mouths were spewing out water in Revelation chapter 12? One. Mouth, one mouth. See, is that the same head, the head that, uh, that uh, has the deadly wound and the mouth that is spewing out waters during the 1260 years? Absolutely. And then we find in Revelation 13 that the waters are going to flow again, aren't they? Because the beast from the earth is going to join with the beast from the sea, and there's going to be persecution. People are not going to be able to buy or sell. People are going to be subject to a death decree because they don't worship the beast or his image or receive the mark. So do you see the parallel there? Now let's go to Daniel 11 where we have the same parallel because Daniel 11 is following the sequence of Revelation 12 and Revelation 13. The subtitle is The Perspective of Daniel 11, 40 to 45. Though this passage actually falls outside the immediate scope of the study of Revelation 17, a few remarks I think would be helpful at this point. Daniel 11, 31 to 39 describes the king of the north persecuting the saints of the Most High. It actually says so there if you read those verses. You know, they're, it says that they're punished by fire, they're imprisoned, their goods are confiscated, they die by the sword. In other words, it's the same period of 1260 years that God's people are being persecuted according to Daniel 11, 31 to 39. But what happens at the time of the end, at the beginning of verse 40? We already studied this. It says that the king of the south, which is the secularism manifested by the spirit of France, spiritual Egypt, attacks the king of the north and gives the king of the north what? Its deadly wound. Is that the end of the story? No, because you continue reading verse 40, 41, 42, and all the way to verse 43, and it tells us that the king of the north then recovers from his wound and actually the words are used. The king of the north overflows is the word that is used. So what, uh, what is it that overflows? Water. So is the king of the north going to persecute again after the king of the south gives it its deadly wound? Absolutely. So does Daniel 11 follow the same pattern of Revelation 12 and Revelation chapter 13? Absolutely. Now, we said that in Revelation chapter 12, the waters will flow again, right? In Revelation chapter 13, waters will flow again. Now, where do we find in the book of Revelation a description of when the waters will flow again? We have it in Revelation 12, 17, where it says that the dragon is enraged with the woman. We have it in Revelation chapter 13, where the land beast joins the sea beast in persecuting again. But where do we find in Revelation the actual terminology of flowing waters? 
we find that in Revelation chapter 17. Are the waters flowing again in Revelation chapter 17? Where is the harlot seated? She is seated on many waters. And what are those waters? They are the river Euphrates. And the Euphrates represents multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. So are the waters flowing again in Revelation chapter 17? Absolutely. But is that the end of the story? No. What's going to happen with the waters according to Revelation chapter 16 at the time of the sixth plague? The waters that are flowing again, that are persecuting God's people, are going to be what? The Euphrates is going to dry up to prepare the way for the coming of Jesus with the angels, the kings that come from the east. Are you with me? So all of this fits together like glove in hand. Revelation 12, Revelation 13, Daniel chapter 11, and Revelation chapter 17 all describe the same pattern, and they need to be studied together. Are you with me or not? Now, let's go to our next subtitle, The Harlot's Name. You know, I didn't go with a fine-tooth comb over every aspect of the subtitle, the perspective of Daniel 11, 40 to 45, but you can read it. I described it for you. Now let's go to the harlot's name. The harlot that is sitting on many waters. You know the waters are flowing again. This is the same as the dragon being enraged with the woman and going after the remnant of her seed. This is the same period as the land beast joining with the sea beast to proclaim a death decree against God's people. This is the same period when the king of the north goes out and overflows after it receives a deadly wound. And now we're going to notice that this harlot has a special name. Let's go to this section. The harlot's name is what? Babylon. Babylon. And she is called what? Babylon. The mother of harlots. If the harlot is the mother of harlots, then she must have what? She must have daughters that were born from her at some point in the past. Her daughters are also described as the false prophet or the lamb-horned beast. And we need to compare, of course, the story of Elijah and John the Baptist, which we already have done. The Protestant churches that were born from Roman Catholicism in the 16th century failed to fully sever their relationship with their harlot mother. Instead of completing the Reformation, they fell into an ever deeper apostasy, teaching many of their mothers false doctrines. Is that true? Like mother, like daughters? Do the Protestant churches teach that Sunday is the day we're supposed to keep? Do most of them teach that hell burns forever? Do most teach that the dead know everything? Do most teach that it doesn't matter what you eat or what you drink? Absolutely. So are they embracing many of the teachings of the mother? Absolutely. The book of Revelation clearly teaches that the daughters will be anxious to join church and state just as the mother did. Remember the beast from the earth and how the beast from the earth is going to do the same thing as the mother? Actually, the beast from the earth is going to do everything to help the mother recover her power. Now, notice Ellen White understood this. In Great Controversy, pages 382 and 383, she explains, Babylon is said to be the mother of harlots. By her daughters must be symbolized churches that cling to her doctrines and traditions and follow her example of sacrificing the truth and approval of God in order to form an unlawful alliance with what? With the world. You know, and I love the way Ellen White describes uh, the relationship of Protestants to Sunday. She says that Protestants have fed and cradled this child of the papacy, when she refers to Sunday. The Protestant churches have what? They've cradled this baby that was born from Roman Catholicism, and they've fed this false doctrine from Roman Catholicism. And what has happened to the baby? Whoa, the baby has grown. The baby is no longer a baby. The baby is large and huge. Now, I want to read a couple of statements. One is by Pope John 23, you know Pope Roncalli, uh, he was that, uh, um, that pope that presided Vatican Council II, at least the first part of Vatican Council II, 
which lasted from 1962 to 1965. And John 23, at the opening of the Second Vatican Council, spoke these words to Protestant observers that were present there. She, that is the Roman Catholic Church, she desires to be an affectionate, kind, and patient what? Mother. She is moved by compassion and goodness towards her alienated children. Interesting that he would refer to Protestants as what? The children of the mother church. Also Paul VI, who uh, actually presided after John 23 died, had these words to say. Because of their position, separated brethren are the object of deep and tender affection on the part of the mother church. See once again the idea of mother and daughters. It is a love that feels grief and sadness, the love of a heart wounded by estrangement, because the estrangement pre prevents our brethren from enjoying so many privileges and rights and makes them lose so much grace. But perhaps for this very reason, its love is all the deeper and more burning. Oh, that sounds really conciliatory, doesn't it? But once again, and I could give you other quotations, where at Vatican Council II, Protestants were invited to be present as observers. And time and again, the popes that presided, as well as Cardinal Augustine Bea, who was the, the in charge of this effort to bring unity in the Christian world, they constantly referred to the Roman Catholic Church as the mother and to the Protestants as the separated children of the Roman Catholic Church. Thus, Revelation 17 describes a wicked threefold alliance between the harlot, her daughters, and the kings of the earth. Do we have all three of those in Revelation 17? The harlot fornicates with the kings, and she's the mother, so she must have what? Daughters. So is this a threefold alliance at the end of time? Absolutely. Now Ellen White makes a very interesting uh, statement. Actually, this, this is a passage that most Adventists don't know even exists. It's in the Spalding McGann collection, pages 1 and 2. And listen how this is going to transpire, the relationship between the mother and the daughters. She says, I saw the two-horned beast had a dragon's mouth. Is that in Revelation 13? Yes. And that his power was in his head. And that the de so, so is this uh, power a head? Is the word head used with this power? Yes. So it says, and that his power was in his head. And that the decree would go out of his what? Out of his mouth. How does this lamb beast, this beast that has two horns like a lamb, how does it speak? Through, yes, the dragon. It speaks for the dragon. But actually it speaks through its legislature. In other words, it speaks through Congress, laws given by Congress. Then she says this, Then I saw the mother of harlots, that the mother was not the daughters, but separate and distinct from them. That's important. Does it seem to indicate that Catholicism and Protestantism would, be, would cover two heads in Revelation 17? It does. She has had her day, and it is past. What time is that, when she had her day and it is past? The 1260 years. And her daughters, the Protestant sects, were the next to come on the stage and act out the same mind that the mother had when she persecuted the saints. During when? During the 1260 years. That the mother, uh, then uh, Ellen White continues saying, I saw that as the mother has been declining in power, the daughters had been growing, and soon they will exercise the power once exercised by the mother. In other words, they're going to please the mother. Is that in Revelation chapter, six, uh, chapter 13? The second beast does everything to help what? The first beast. You know, the daughters are going to say, hey, let's help, help mom get her power back. She continues writing, I saw the nominal church and nominal Adventists, like Judah, this is Judas, this is other groups of Christians, like Judas would betray us 
to the Catholics to obtain their influence to come against the truth. So are Protestants going to say, hey, let's have Catholics help us in this endeavor of establishing Sunday? Absolutely. She continues writing, the saints then will be an obscure people, little known to the Catholics. But the churches and nominal Adventists who know of our faith and customs, for they hated us on account of the Sabbath, for they could not refute it, will betray the saints and report them to the Catholics as those who disregard the institutions of the people. That is, that they keep the Sabbath and disregard Sunday. Then the Catholics bid the Protestants to go forward. But who comes up with the idea? <laughs> who comes up with the idea of the Sunday law and, and uh, uniting church and state? It's, it's the false prophet. It's the United States. And then what does Catholicism say? Wow, this is too good to be true. Go for it. So then the Catholics bid the Protestants go forward and issue a decree that all who will not observe the first day of the week instead of the seventh shall be slain. And the Catholics, whose, large, whose numbers are large, will stand by the Protestants. So, so who is the dangerous figure here at the end time? It's the daughters. But really, the real dangerous figure is who? The mother. Because the daughters are simply going to do what the mother wants, right? That's the story of John the Baptist. Who is the dangerous figure in the story of John the Baptist? <laughs> Who wants the death of John the Baptist? Oh, the mother does. So, so what does the mother do? The mother, by the way, when the king was under the influence of wine, hello, uh, the mother, uh, the daughter comes and says, Hey, Mom, what should I ask for? And the mother says, The head of John the Baptist. Was the daughter just like the mother? You know, if, if this daughter was not like her mother, she would have said, Mom, what are you talking about? But what did she say? She said, oh, okay. And so basically they went and they beheaded John in prison. That's the scenario that we're going to have in the end time. And remember that John the Baptist is the New Testament Elijah. So let's go back here. Then the Catholics bid the Protestants to go forward and issue a decree that all who will not observe the first day of the week, instead of the seventh day, shall be slain. And the Catholics, whose numbers are large, will stand by the Protestants. The Catholics will give their power to the image of the beast. And the Protestants will work as their mother worked before them to destroy the saints. Do you see this uh, coalition between mother and daughter? And by the way, are the kings also involved? Is the civil power also involved here? Absolutely. Now, in this remarkable statement, Ellen White clearly affirms that Protestants will make overtures and seek to gain the influence of the Catholics. And then the Catholics will tell Protestants to go ahead and proclaim a Sunday law. The present efforts of the religious right to enlist Catholics, and you need to read those additional pages from yesterday because they, it tells about how Protestants have drawn closer and closer to Roman Catholics through all of these social issues. So the present efforts of the religious right to enlist Catholics in the fight against abortion, gay marriage, pornography, poverty, climate change, and other social evils will come back to haunt them. And the liberal fringe will fall into the trap as well by seeing in Sunday observance a way to what? To save the environment, the family, and to eradicate poverty. Are you starting to catch what, how the scenario is going to work out? The Spirit of Prophecy makes it clear. You have, in the Bible, you have, you have the basic information. Ellen White gives us an amplification of how this is going to develop. Now, in a related statement, Ellen White gives her understanding actually it's God's understanding, of Revelation 17 verses 1 through 4. This is a significant statement and we're going to notice for several reasons. In the 17th of Revelation is foretold the destruction of all the churches. So do we know that Revelation 17 has to do with the moment when the king of the north will come to his end with none to help him? Does this chapter deal with the time when God's people will be delivered, everyone who is written in the book? Absolutely. When the harlot will be made naked and desolate and she will be burnt with fire? Absolutely. 
So she says, in the 17th of Revelation is foretold the destruction, destruction of all the churches who corrupt themselves by idolatrous devotion to the surface of the papacy. So who are these churches that are being spoken of by Ellen White here? These are the Protestant churches because they devote themselves to the service of whom? Of the papacy. So these are the Protestant churches that are linked up with the papacy. And then she continues saying, those who have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Thus is represented the papal power. In other words, the harlot represents the papal power in Revelation 17. Which with all deceivableness of unrighteousness by outside attraction and gorgeous display deceives all nations, all nations, promising them as did Satan our first parents, all good to those who receive its mark and all harm to those who oppose its fallacies. The power which has the deepest inward corruption will make the greatest display and will clothe itself with the most elaborate signs of power. Now let me just make a parenthesis here. A couple of weeks ago I was presenting a series in, in Milan, Italy. Ellen White was in Europe from 1885 to 1887 and one of the places that she visited on a tour was the city of Milan and she actually visited the cathedral of Milan. Uh, uh, Steve went with me because I wanted him to take uh, pictures in all of these sites because what we're going to do is a documentary about Ellen White's comments on the cathedral of Milan. Ellen White has a long article in Review and Herald where she describes her visit to the cathedral in Milan. And she, you know, she describes the cathedral in minute detail and, you know, she's writing like she's really impressed about what she's seen, the gorgeous display. I mean, uh, Steve and I went to the, to the top of the tower. You know, we toured the whole, whole cathedral. And, you know, you can't help but be spellbound, and your mouth falls open when you see the extravagance of this cathedral, which took 600 years to build. And Ellen White, when she writes, you can tell she's impressed, but then she ends by saying, this was simply a vast pile of extravagance. <laughs> and that's exactly what it is. But what does it do? It wows the world. The music, the vestments, the ceremonies, the imposing structures, they impress the people in the world to think that this is the system that God has established. That's what Ellen White is describing here. Once again, the Bible plainly declares that this, that this display covers a corrupt and deceiving wickedness. Upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Now here comes the key part. I'm going to argue later on in this material, and we'll probably finish tomorrow morning, that the United States is a separate kingdom. It is one of the heads of Revelation chapter 17 because it is a separate kingdom and the United States will give its kingdom to the last head in the series. Now listen to this part of the statement. What is it that gives its kingdom to this power? What is it that gives its kingdom to the papacy, in other words? So is there a kingdom that's going to give its kingdom to the next kingdom? Yes. It's different than all the other kingdoms. All the other kingdoms fought with the previous kingdom to gain the power. But here it says that this kingdom is going to give its kingdom to the last head. Notice it says, Ellen White answers what this kingdom is that will give its kingdom. She answers what? Protestantism, a power which while professing to have the temper and spirit of a lamb and to be allied to heaven, speaks with the voice of a dragon. It is moved by a power from beneath. So is the United States going to actually lose its sovereignty and give over the kingdom to the next and last power? According to this statement from Ellen White, yes, absolutely. Now let's take a look at the names of blasphemy. What is blasphemy according to the Bible? Well we know it's when a human power claims to represent God on earth and when that human power claims to have the power to what? To forgive sins. Is that true of the harlot? Is that true of the Roman Catholic papacy? Do they claim to have the Pope as the representative of Christ vicarious filly day? Yes. 
Does the papacy claim to have power to forgive sins? They are claiming to have the power and prerogatives of God. The Bible defines that as blasphemy. Now let's go to our next subtitle, The Harlot's Attire or Her Clothing. Purple and scarlet are the colors of royalty, are they not? You can read that in John 19 verse 5, Matthew 27, 28. It'll take you a while to negotiate this material if you read all of the verses. See, we can't take the time to read all of the verses, that's why I gave you a syllabus. So that when you go home, or maybe here in the afternoons, you read those verses. Look them up, because they add information that will give you a, a more complete picture. So John 19 verse 5 and Matthew 27, 28 tells us that they put a purple and scarlet robe on Jesus. They were going to hail him as what? As a king, yes, royalty. The harlot is attired with gold, silver, precious stones, and pearls. This indicates that this is what kind of a system? A very rich and ostentatious power. Notably in the Old Testament, Israel clothed herself with all this paraphernalia to entice the kings of the surrounding nations to fornicate with her. If you want to notice that, read Ezekiel 16 and Ezekiel 23. God says to Israel, you painted your eyes, and you put on your earrings, and you, and you dressed yourself in nice clothing so that the kings would come and they say, wow, we want to fornicate with Israel. So are you catching the picture? The ostentation of the Roman Catholic system wows the leaders of the world into thinking that this is God's system. Ellen White explains what this fancy attire and the gold and silver and precious stones represent. She says in Great Controversy, page 382, the purple and scarlet color, the gold and precious stones and pearls vividly picture the magnificence and more than kingly pomp affected by the haughty sea of Rome. Did Ellen White understand that this harlot represents the Rome, Roman Catholic system? She understands it clearly. So does this have any relationship uh, with Revelation chapter 12? The 1260 years? Yeah. Does it have any relationship with the beast of Revelation 13? So can you isolate 17 from 12 and 13? No. In short, folks, Revelation 17 is describing the time when the deadly wound is healed. It's that simple. It's describing the time when the waters are going to flow again and God's people will be persecuted by this system as they were persecuted in the past. Incidentally, what is God's color? What is the color of God's law, the color of God's commandments? It is blue. Have you ever seen Roman Catholic vestments with blue? Never. It is always purple and it is scarlet. Very significant. Now let's talk about the golden cup with the wine. You see, uh, this, this harlot has a cup and in her cup she has wine. And what does she do with her wine? She gives her wine to the kings and to the inhabitants of the earth. And what happens when she gives the wine? Oh, they say, this is really good. This is delicious wine. Is this, uh, is this uh, grape juice? <laughs> it's not grape juice. It is fermented wine because it intoxicates according to Revelation chapter 17. The golden cup in the harlot's hand contains the wine of Babylon. The wine is identified as her abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. Now let me just share something with you now. For many years I wondered what the wine represented. You know, uh, the way that we apply Scripture, the way that we study Scripture is, you know, if it says wine here, we need to go to all of the passages in the Bible that mention wine to find out what wine symbolizes. But I kept coming up with a blank because every text that I read was speaking about literal wine. I couldn't find any text that really said that wine represents false doctrine or false teachings. No matter how many texts I looked, I looked them all up that speak about wine, and it's always literal wine. And so I said, I know that Ellen White is right when she says that the wine of Babylon are her false teachings and her false concepts, but that's got to be in the Bible somewhere. 
So one day I was sitting there uh, studying this and praying about it, as I have done many, many times, and suddenly it struck me that in Revelation chapter 17, if you go with me there just for a moment, Revelation chapter 17, I don't know how I missed this for so long, it says in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 4, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup. Now what does she have in the golden cup? In other places it says she has wine, right? But here it says that in the cup was what? Oh, a cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. So I said, maybe I ought to look up the word abominations. Because the wine is her abominations. Are you with me? So I said, let's look up abominations. And a whole scenario opened up before me. You'll notice here in your syllabus that this is the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So she fornicates with the kings, she gives the kings wine, and it's the wine of wrath. Why is it called the wine of wrath? Because whoever does not drink the wine will suffer the wrath of this system. In a few moments we're going to come back to that. But according to the Bible, what is abomination? Here is the list. Number one, idol worship is called explicitly an abomination. Is the papacy guilty of idol worship? Mm -hmm. Yes. Number two, attempting to speak to and with the dead is called an abomination, spiritualism. Does the Roman Catholic system claim to be able to communicate with the dead? They pray to the dead. They pray to Mary and they pray to all of the saints. So the Roman Catholic system has this abomination. The Bible says that whoever refuses to hear the law of God, that is an abomination. Is that true of the papacy? Yes, it's sought to change the law. The Bible says that adultery is an abomination. Does the papacy commit spiritual adultery? Absolutely. The Bible says that eating unclean meats is an abomination. Does the papacy say anything about re re abstaining from eating pork and shrimp and lobster? Absolutely not. Anything goes. Roman Catholics smoke and drink and the church has nothing to say about that. Also we are told that shedding innocent blood is an abomination. Does the papacy have a history of shedding innocent blood? Yes. And finally, the Bible tells us that sun worship is the greatest of all abominations. You know, I've been to the Vatican Museum and to many cathedrals. One of my favorite pastimes when I go to Latin America, I tell the person that invites me, I say, I want to visit as many cathedrals as I can. I want to visit as many Catholic churches as I can. And there's something that just, you can't fail to see it. And that is, in Roman Catholic churches, there are sunbursts everywhere. Sun, the sun is everywhere, everywhere. On chalices, it is on, you know, on, on, on vestments, it is on uh, cups, it is, uh, you know, on art, it is everywhere, the sunburst. Why? Because the Roman Catholic Church inherited the day of the sun from the Roman Empire, from paganism. Even though they try to say that, you know, Jesus gave the church the right to change the day from Sabbath to Sunday, it has nothing to do with, uh, the, with the literal sun. The fact is that history proves just the contrary. First, in fact, the first Sunday law was given by Constantine, the emperor of the Roman Empire. And it didn't take very long for this civil uh, Sunday law to become a religious law. Uh, law. That same law that uh, Constantine gave, which was a civil law, in the year 3, that was 321, in the year 336, at the Council of Laodicea, the church converted it into a religious Sunday law. The very same law that Constantine gave. So, is the Roman Catholic system guilty on all counts? Are Protestants guilty on many of these counts? Absolutely. 
Now let me read you from Ellen White a very significant statement on what the wine is. Now that we've seen that the Bible tells us that the wine is all of these false teachings and all of these practices, let's see what Ellen White has to say. Testimonies to Ministers, pages 61 and 62. The fallen denominational churches are Babylon. Babylon has been fostering poisonous doctrines, the wine of error. So what is the wine? Poisonous doctrines. This wine of error is made up of false doctrines, such as the natural immortality of the soul, the eternal torment of the wicked, the denial of the pre-existence of Christ prior to His birth in Bethlehem, and advocating and exalting the first day of the week above God's holy and sanctified day. These and kindred errors, this is only the tip of the iceberg, the ones that she's mentioned, these and other kindred errors are presented to the world by the various churches. And thus the scriptures are fulfilled that say, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. It is a wrath which is created by false doctrines. Now notice why it is the wine of the wrath. And when kings and presidents, is that the secular power? So who is the harlot giving the wine to? To the kings and presidents, the political rulers. Uh, and when kings and presidents drink this wine of the wrath of her fornication, they are stirred with what? With anger against those who will not come into harmony with the false and satanic heresies which exalt the false Sabbath and lead men to trample underfoot God's memorial. So basically what has happened, and we're going to look at this a little bit later, is that the multitudes and rulers have swallowed this wine and they've really been happy with the wine. How many of you have ever get, tried to give a Bible study to a drunk? It's, a, it's almost a lost, lost cause, right? And so when you talk to people and you say, you try to show them that the Sabbath is a day of rest and you read all of the Bible verses that say, I don't get it. Why do they say they don't get it? Because they're drunk. They're drunk with the wine of Babylon. So somehow we've got to get them sober first. And then when they're sober, then they can sit down and things can make sense to their minds. Now, People are, going to, uh, people are going to enjoy the wine, the presidents are going to enjoy the wine, but the time is coming where they will become very sober, and they're going to turn against the harlot who gave them the wine. Next page. In the above statement, Ellen White blames the churches for giving the rulers of the world the wine of Babylon. But in the statement in Great Controversy that we're going to read now, page 389, she is more specific. It is the ministers, the men of learning of the apostate churches, who are guilty of the spiritual intoxication of the world. Listen to this statement that is found in Great Controversy, page 389. When faithful teachers expound the word of God, there arise men of learning, ministers professing to understand the scriptures, who denounce sound doctrine as heresy, and thus turn away inquirers after truth. Were it not that the world is hopelessly intoxicated with the wine of Babylon, multitudes would be convicted and converted by the plain cutting truths of the Word of God. But religious faith appears so confused and discordant that the people know not what to believe as truth. The sin of the world's impenitence lies at the door of the church. Who is to blame for uh, what is happening in society today? The church. Primarily the leadership of the church. Because as the leader is, so will the people be. The people will not rise any higher than their leader. So somehow, you know, we have to, uh, we have to convince people to follow what the Bible says instead of following necessarily what their leaders say. And that's so difficult because they love their leaders. And that's understandable because they've spent years and years with their leaders in their churches. And by the way, many of these leaders are sincere. You remember the testimony that we watched? This guy, what was it, for, for 30 some years or almost 40 years, you know, he was certain that he was right. 
and that those who kept the Sabbath, you know, they were kind of uh, lunatic fringe. Those are not his words, but that's basically what he was saying. And then through the witnessing of these students that went to his school, uh, he says, wow, you know, I thought I was going to teach them, and here these little kids are teaching me. And so he and his entire church decides to begin keeping God's seventh-day Sabbath. Are there many other ministers out there who are in the same boat? Yes. I believe that there are thousands and thousands of them. Ellen White, in fact, says so in Great Controversy, that when the loud cry is given, they will come out, and they will be members of God's remnant church. And you know what? Lots of those who are in will end up going out. And we have some of them that are already going out. Now, notice Ellen White quoting Revelation chapter 17, verse 4, she, uh, 1 through 4. She already quoted this, and she makes this comment. And we already read it, but let's read it again in this context. In the 17th of Revelation is foretold the destruction of all the churches, these are the Protestant churches, who corrupt themselves by idolatrous devotion to the service of the papacy, those who have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Thus is represented the papal power, which with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, by outside attraction and gorgeous display, deceives all nations, promising them, as did Satan, our first parents, all good to those who receive its mark, and all harm to those who who oppose its fallacies. So Babylon will do this through the wine that it gives to the nations. Now, the, the good news that we find in all of these prophecies is that God always has a faithful remnant. In all of these chapters that we've studied, God has a faithful remnant. Let's notice how they are referred to in these prophecies. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 13 and verse 15, what are God's people called? They are called the what? The woman. Does the dragon persecute the woman? Yes. Is the woman the faithful church? Absolutely. In Revelation chapter 12, 17, they are referred to as what? The remnant of her seed. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 7, they are called what? The saints of the Most High and the beast persecutes them. And in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 6, they are called the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. Does God have a faithful people in all of these chapters that we find here? Absolutely. And the Bible says, He who endures unto the end, the same shall be saved. Notice this statement from Ellen White. Once again, Revelation. Uh, she's commenting on Revelation 17 verse 6, which shows that she believes the harlot is the Roman Catholic system. Uh, she uh, wrote this in Great Controversy 382. The power that for so many centuries maintained despotic sway over the monarchs of Christendom is Rome. See once again church and state there? And no other power could be so truly declared, and now she quotes Revelation 17 6, drunken with the blood of the saints, as that church which has so cruelly persecuted the followers of Christ. Babylon is also charged with the sin of unlawful connection with the kings of the earth. So far so good? Are you understanding all the pieces of the puzzle? See, we're just looking at the pieces now. We're classifying the pieces so that then we can take all of the pieces, put them together, and then we have the complete picture. Now, let's talk about the seven-headed dragon. It took us quite a while to talk about the harlot, didn't it? Didn't it? Well, let's notice now Revelation chapter 17 and the seven-headed scarlet dragon. Why do you suppose the dragon is scarlet? What is scarlet? What color is scarlet? It is a deep red. Why do you suppose this dragon is scarlet? Well, it must be communism because red is the color of communism, right? And you know, that's the way some people interpret scripture. But in the Bible, red is blood. Now, why is this dragon beast red? Because the harlot uses it to what? To slay the saints of the Most High, to shed the blood of God's people. Now, J.N. Andrews, whom I believe to be the greatest scholar in the history of the Adventist church, and uh, it's not a coincidence that our highest uh, 
uh, seminary, our seminary and our most famous school where people go from all over the world to get their education is called Andrews University. Uh, although I think that if, uh, if uh, Jay and Andrews resurrected today, he might die of a heart attack. But uh, anyway, uh, I believe it was the greatest, he was the greatest scholar in the history of the Adventist church and very committed to the church. He loved the Seventh-day Adventist church and our message. He quoted or he wrote in a book, The Three Angels' Messages, pages 77 and 78, what he understood to be the meaning of the, of the beasts of Revelation 12, 13, and 17. And I agree with him. Notice what he had to say about these three beasts. The seven heads are seven forms of civil power which successively bear rule. Is that registering? So, in other words, the seven heads represent seven successive civil powers that rule in succession. He continues writing, these seven heads belong alike to the dragon of Revelation 12, the beast of Revelation 13, and that of Revelation 17. So must there be a relationship among these three? Of course. This shows conclusively, says J. N. Andrews, that the dragon and these two beasts are symbols of the same power under what? Different heads. For there are not three sets of seven heads, but it is evidence that the heads are successive forms of its power, one of them bearing rule at a time, and then giving place to another. The proper period of each seems to be this, the dragon before the 1260 years. Remember the dragon that tried to kill the child? Is that before the 1260 years? Absolutely. The beast of chapter 13 during that period. And the beast of chapter 17 since the deadly wound and captivity at the close of that period. Are you, are you seeing what he's saying? He's saying that, that, these, that these heads represent, uh, uh, the, uh, these are actually the last three heads, he's saying that they represent, uh, the dragon represents the Roman Empire. The beast of Revelation 13 represents Papal Rome. And the beast of Revelation chapter 17 is Papal Rome restored to power. So three of those heads must be Pagan Rome, Papal Rome, and Papal Rome what? Restored to power. Now we come to a point which is very important and uh, we'll deal with this uh, during the last 10 minutes that we have and then we will continue uh, expounding upon this in our first class tomorrow. In order to comprehend the meaning of the seven-headed dragon upon which the harlot sits, we must first understand how the ancients perceived river dragons. The ancients believed that mountains were heads of a great cosmic river serpent dragon. According to their worldview, the mountains or heads would spew out waters. Do we still refer to headwaters? Yeah, that's where they originate, right? Which would flow. Do we talk, talk about a body of water? Talk about a body of water too, right? Those are remnants from this ancient concept. So, so according to their worldview, the mountains or heads, because they're the same thing, it says the seven heads are seven mountains, so they're interchangeable. Uh, the mount, the, in their worldview, the mountains or heads would spew out waters which would flow down into the valley. As the river twisted and turned tortuously in the valley, it looked like the body of a great river serpent dragon. According to their view, when the river was at flood stage, it overflowed its banks and sprouted wings. <laughs> That's quite exotic imagery. Now let's go to Isaiah 8, 7, and 8. Now Revelation 17 doesn't mention wings, but uh, we're, we're helped by Isaiah chapter 8, verses 7 and 8, which is speaking about the invasion of Sennacherib into Judah. Once again, where did I say that we're going? We're going to Isaiah 8 and verses 7 and 8. 
speaking about the invasion into Judah. It says there uh, the following, Now therefore, behold, the Lord brings up over them the waters of the river. What is that river? What happens when it says the river? It's the Euphrates, yes. Of the river, strong and mighty. And what, are, what do the waters represent? Here comes the explanation. The king of Assyria and all his glory. So what do the waters symbolize here? They, they symbolize the invasion of the king of Assyria into the land of Judah. What does he come into the land of Judah for? What is he flooding for? Because he wants to destroy Israel. He wants to destroy Judah. And now notice what, what he's compared to. He will go up over all his channels and go, go over all his banks. This is the king, of, uh, the king of Assyria, but he's being symbolized by what? By a flooding river. He will pass through Judah. He will overflow and pass over. He will reach up to the neck, and the stretching out of his wings will fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. Incidentally, the last part of Daniel chapter 9 also speaks about the wing, on the wing of abomination shall come the one who shall make desolate. So, so what happens if you look, you know, if you're up on a mountain and you're looking down at a valley and you see a tortuous river and, you, and the river has gone out of its banks, what does it look like? It looks like a dragon. The, the mountain is the head where the water comes down and the waters form the body of the serpent dragon, and then the wings are the flood. Are you with me? See, we don't think this way. And by the way, I have a document, if anybody's interested in, in the full exposition of this in the ancient world. I had a teacher uh, at Andrews University, uh, probably the best teacher that I ever had. Um, his name is Douglas Waterhouse. He lives in Hawaii. And he wrote a whole article looking at all the uh, archaeological sources and historical sources of this concept. This concept was prevalent in the ancient world. And so we're just basically using the concept that existed in that culture. We're not used to talking this way. But they were used to talking this way. Now let's go back here. It is, a, is, it is the up, of the utmost importance to keep in mind that Revelation 12, 15 and 16 and 17, 15 uh, 9 and verse 15 is drawing on this ancient concept. But in Revelation, the river dragon takes on a symbolic meaning. The mountains symbolize what? In the Bible, mountains are kingdoms, folks. In Daniel 2, what is the mountain? The stone hits the feet of the image and it becomes a great mountain. And it's explained. God will establish a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Mountains in Scripture represent kingdoms. In Jeremiah 51, it says that God is going to take, uh, 51, 25, God says He's going to take Babylon, uh, and it's going to be like a burning mountain thrown into the sea. So mountains in Scripture represent kingdoms. And so the mountains symbolize kingdoms, and the waters represent what? Multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. It is important to understand that the nations, multitudes, tongues, and peoples actually form the body of the dragon beast. Are you catching the picture? Yes. Now, this is the reason why the harlot is described as sitting. Now, notice, she's sitting on a scarlet beast. Right? But she's also sitting on the waters. Now, wait a minute. How can she be sitting on the scarlet beast and on the waters at the same time? Because the scarlet beast is the body of the dragon, which are the what? The waters. Are you following me or not? And it says, it says the seven heads are seven mountains, but they are also seven kingdoms. So the mountains represent kingdoms, and what are the kingdoms doing? They're spewing out water at the behest of the harlot to do what? To drown God's people. Are you catching the picture? Now, let's go back here to the material. In other words, the waters and the scarlet beast are interchangeable, and the waters and dragon are scarlet because they are what? They are filled with the blood of God's people. The reliability of this ancient view, as it applies to Revelation chapter 17, is seen in the fact that the seven heads are also identified as seven what? Mountains. Where do rivers originate? They originate in mountains. And if you don't understand that, you don't live in Fresno. <laughs> 
because the waters that we get in Fresno come from the mountains, from the Sierra Nevada. As we have already seen, in antiquity the mountains were conceived as the heads of a dragon beast, but the heads are also what? Mountains. See the mountains spew out the water, the heads spew out the water, it's the same idea, and the waters go down into the valley and they look like the body of a dragon or the body of a serpent, and the harlot sits on the waters. It is crucially important to realize that while the heads or mountains, this is very important, are spewing out waters, the dragon beast is what? Alive. Correct? When the heads or mountains, however, cease to spew out waters, the dragon beast is what? Dead. Is that true in Revelation 13? What happens? What happens with the head that was spewing out waters in Revelation chapter 12? The waters are what? Dried up. That's the same as the head receiving what? A deadly wound. So are the waters being spewed out from the head when the head has a deadly wound? Absolutely not. Now let's are, are you catching the picture? This is different, you know, different than usually we think because we're not accustomed to be to work within that culture. Uh, she continues, uh, we continue here. Thus the beast is alive or dead, depending on whether the harlot is able to use the head to persecute God's people. That is to say, when the harlot commands the kings to order the multitudes to persecute God's people, the dragon beast is alive. But when the civil powers uphold democratic principles and keep aloof from the church, the dragon beast is dead. Is that making sense? It kind of brings it all together. So, to introduce what we're going to study in our first session tomorrow, there are three seven-headed beasts. The first one rises in heaven, the one in Revelation 12. The one in Revelation 13 rises from the sea. The one in Revelation 17 rises from the abyss. Do you think it's important to understand why these three beasts rise in three different places? You better believe it. There's a reason why the beast of Revelation chapter 17 does not rise from the earth, it does not rise from the sea. It does not rise in heaven. It rises where? It rises from the underworld. It arises from the deep or from the abyss as it is translated in the book of Revelation. So tomorrow in our first session we will attempt to finish this material. Visit secretsunsealed.org for annual class dates and topics. Anchor is a seminary-level course of study on the fundamentals of Seventh-day Adventist theology taught by Pastor Stephen Bohr and guest theologians. Seating is limited.